for better days to come and carry us like wind in our sails. Hold on tight, I can smell the shore, it's right in front of us if we just hold on tight. This vision that I saw is getting closer every dawn. Dreamers of the Some lemon balm leaves that I've just taken from the garden with some of the ice in it because it's quite a warm day here, not as warm as it has been, but uh, it's still midsummer, so it's uh, it's definitely a, a day for, for drinking a cool drink in this part of the world anyway. So cheers everyone. Oh, it's lovely. So I hope wherever you are in the world that you are drinking something appropriate to the weather. And um, so you're all very welcome. Um, my name is Anya and I'm podcasting from the West of Ireland. And um, so this is the 14th episode, I can't believe it. And um, it's nearly a year since I started. This isn't going to be my podversary podcast. I'm going to do that the next one I do in a couple of weeks time at the beginning of July. So I'm delighted to be able to have got all of my knitting together and a little bit of information on um, today we're going to be talking about midsummer and we're going to be talking about the plant I'm going to be looking at today is the fern or bracken as it's also known. So yeah you're really really welcome and um, thank you for all of the usual uh, loyal viewers who've been with me for a while and who keep commenting and sending me lovely posts on um, on the channel and uh, really warm warm welcome to anybody who's new watching this today and uh, yes yeah, so you're all very welcome to the west of Ireland and um, so I have um, a few pieces of knitting to show you not a huge amount because it is the middle of the summer and it is uh, it's so busy there's so much going on and um, so little time it seems for knitting at the moment um, I've also had a little bit of trouble with my right shoulder. I think I might have mentioned that in the last podcast. And that trouble, I'm trying to do a little bit less knitting. And um, yeah, so I'm, and I'm trying to uh, do, I'm doing a bit of uh, yoga to help work out my shoulder. Um, I can really feel the stiff muscles in my uh, right shoulder, in the right side, my right arm, and in my back, uh, which is wherever it's connected to the shoulder, so around the scapula, I can feel all of those muscles have just got really tight because I haven't been doing as much exercise as I should have been. And it's funny to think that um, just that, that knitting is seen as, as such a, uh, in a way, I mean, not everywhere in the world, but I know there are perceptions that it's something that's, uh, that's done, um, you know, when you're slightly older, when you're when you're less mobile, and that's possible as well. That you can, it, it's a great activity for that. But actually, it's really physical. Um, knitting is a really physical activity, 
Um, and I think we sometimes underestimate that, especially when we're doing a lot of it. Um, and I think that where, where I got the issues with my shoulder, they came from the garment that I'm wearing at the moment, because I tried to knit the two sleeves together for the first time. So, on to the, uh, the knitting. So this is, as you'll probably recognise, this is my um, downtown hoodie by Tori Yu who is um, on Instagram, she's at Tori Knits NYC, so she's based in New York, New York, New York City. And uh, the yarn that I used is Old Centrum, so it's a Swedish yarn, and uh, Old Centrum 2 ply, and the, the, uh, the dark colour, the black, is a anthracite, it's called, and the red in the stripes is Falu Red which if anybody has been following me on Instagram will see that I ran out of the, the red on the stripes. So what I've used for the drawstrings is a slightly different shade of red. It's more of an orangey shade. So, but I think that I can get away with it. It doesn't really matter too much that it's a slightly different shade. So yeah, this is, uh, I'll stand up and show you what it looks like on. So that's it there. Really, really beautiful shape. Um, gorgeous um, raglan sleeves. Um, beautiful wide arms that go to a narrow, a narrow cuff, and uh, yeah, it's a really, really nice shape. I love it. So, and of course the hood as well. You can sort of see the hood there. And um, this is probably all a little bit out of focus. I'm probably moved out of the focal range of my, of my lens doing my little demonstration. But the hood is a really, really lovely um, piece, and uh, it's so satisfying to knit. It's such a beautiful pattern and the you can see that the drawstring is actually incorporated into the hood by sewing down the hem of the hood. Now this actually hasn't been blocked so it'll probably sit a little bit more neatly maybe when I after I wash it and block it. But actually it's perfectly fine to wear I reckon as it is at the moment. So that's my downtown hoodie. Um, I was inspired to knit this by watching Amanda of Birch and Lily, her gorgeous podcast. Uh, she, all of everything she knits is just so beautiful, and she dyes her own yarn as well. So it's a real, I highly recommend her. But she, she knit this, and when I saw her, she test knit it, and when I saw her test knit of it, I said, oh, I have to knit that. It's absolutely beautiful. So yeah, I'm really thrilled with the fit of this. It feels so comfortable. It feels casual, it feels, but also feels neat, it feels put together. Um, I'm sure you're going to get loads of use out of this in the autumn. I don't know whether I'm sitting too far forward into the sunshine, which is probably blowing it out a little bit, but it is perfect for autumn, winter here. Um, usually our summers, you can wear this type of thing in the evenings, but it's been so warm here this summer. We've had temperatures in the 20s, uh, 20s Celsius for about four weeks now or four or five weeks actually since the last time I podcast when I was podcasting out in my front garden. Today it's really windy out there so I couldn't get away with podcasting outside and um, but the sun is shining it's much cooler today it's probably down it's down below 20 it's about 19 degrees uh, it's a cool breeze but it's really warm and uh, you know for us it's really warm. Um, so yeah this is my my latest finished object um, so my issues with my shoulder came about through knitting these two sleeves at the same time and because there was so much weight in the jumper and uh, so much fabric to be managing I think I was holding my right arm particularly in a funny way when I was knitting so I developed a strain in my shoulder. So, um, excuse me, and, um, but as I said I am, uh, as I said I'm managing managing that by uh, making myself do a little bit more yoga. I used to teach yoga actually so I am um, uh, and when I was teaching I was doing it every day and then when I stopped I stopped teaching about four years ago I think or five years ago nearly and um, so I don't have I don't do it as often um, but now I'm realizing that actually the older I get I really need to make it a daily practice and I feel great after it, you know, it's just, it's a fantastic way of ironing out all the creases in your body, of strengthening your body, of feeling just uh, calm because of the breathing. So all of this breathing really calms your nervous system and uh, the stretching and the strengthening just makes you feel like a whole new person really. But you have to give it time, it takes time. Uh, and doing it every day, even a little bit every day, is great and really helps. And certainly with my knitting uh, muscles, it, it's definitely helping me now. 
So um, that is my not my only finished object actually, I have another one. So my second finished object are these absolutely gorgeous uh, rainbow socks. So these were knit um, over the last week or so. Um, I was inspired by Sam of an Irish knitting podcast. And his podca on his podcast he gave a sort of quite a, um, a plea from the heart uh, for people to support the, um, the Pride Festival or the Pride Month that, that June is um, because um, it's so important to really to keep up that recognition of the fact that you know we need to recognise diversity and I know that um, just even listening to the advertising for the gay, gay or for the um, LGBTQ plus uh, Pride Festival in Dublin, which happened yesterday, I think today is Sunday, so it would have been Saturday the twenty fifth, was the festival Pride in Dublin, and um, even listening to um, people talking about that on the radio, they were talking about an increase in uh, attacks on. Um, LGBTQ people, they're, you know, people from that community are just uh, facing a, sort of this renewed, um, uh, possibly, you know, negative reaction from, from certain certain parts of the, of the public, obviously not everybody, um, but, you know, so it's really just important to maintain that, um, you know, fight, I suppose, for, or at least to, to for, um, to recognise that everybody is included in society and um, you know we had a gay marriage referendum um, a couple of years but not that long ago I think 2019 and uh, it was passed so that was seen as a huge step forward for gay rights in Ireland um, but now we seem to be slipping back a little bit so anyway Sam his little plea from, from the heart was very much heard by me and I really wanted to contribute to his CAL which is called the Rainbow CAL 2020 or Rainbow CAL 23. I'll put it up on the screen here. And uh, so I knit these absolutely gorgeous socks uh, in honour of the uh, of Pride Month and uh, his his CAL. So these are knit from my stash of Old Centrum. So it's another great knit from stash project, which I'm really thrilled about, um, that I keep pulling out stuff that, I mean, this has been in my stash for about three years now. Uh, I think I bought a whole, I bought one uh, ball of a whole range of colors um, because I had this idea of designing a shawl and knitting a shawl, which I never got around to. Um, so this is uh, what's come from that incredible yarn. So we have, most of these colours are Old Centrum 2 ply, the same as the um, the yarn that went into my downtown hoodie. And uh, there's just one of them, what I used uh, for the indigo, this really dark blue colour. So this was one of the ones that I, yarns that I picked up in Amsterdam, I think, or certainly, yeah, it wasn't Amsterdam, it was in Leiden, uh, a little yarn shop in Leiden when we visited Holland there last year, uh, the Netherlands uh, last year, so last December. And uh, it is a Norwegian yarn, the name of which I forget. It's one of the, um, oh, I'll put it in the show notes below. I forget the name, but it's Norwegian anyway. So uh, yeah, I'm thrilled with these socks. There's the pair. Again, these happened, these are literally just off the needles today. Let's finish the second one today. And I have to wash them, block them, um, and sew in the weave in the ends because there are tons of ends from stripes. And this pattern, the pattern I used, was the one that I use all the time for uh, socks these days because I've just got so used to it. Is the Denise DeSantis Earth Jones Girl um, sock explorations socks pattern, and it has the the uh, short row shadow shadow wrap heel. Uh, don't look too closely here, I actually have a hole which has to be sewn up. Um, but the short row shadow, shadow wrap heel and the, and the rest of it I do the Norwegian uh, long tail cast on for, to make nice stretchy bind offs at the top. I stitch, so it's top down I knit them. So she has you knit a 2x2 two two rib in the cuff and then I just did the stripes whatever width I, you know, I just decided on a width. So I've done seven rows per stripe of this particular yarn which is the sport weight and then when you get to the heel you do your shadow wrap short rows 
and then when you get to the toe you do a um, slip set knit and um, knit two together decrease both sides every second row until you get to a certain number of stitches and then you do it every row so it's in her pattern so it's a really simple pattern for me to memorize I have this memorized off so I don't need to worry about having to look at the pattern and uh, I just have really got into knitting socks this year so I've been trying to knit one for every month or at least for every time I do a podcast so these are my June pride socks and uh, they'll be going into the Irish cal sorry not the Irish cal They'll be going into the pri the rainbow, Rainbow Cal 23 is the name of the cal um, that they're going into. So um, yeah, that's, uh, that's all for the finished objects. And then I have one work in progress, which you would have seen on my last podcast. And that is this absolutely beautiful um, Soldotna crop. And now that I pick it up again, I can't wait to start knitting. This is this has actually been put on hold for a little bit because I ran out of one of the colours. Um, so I ran out of the... I'm holding um, Merino singles together with uh, Silk Mohair uh, in four different colours. And they were all stash colours that I had. But I knew that one of them I was going to run out of because I didn't have enough in my stash. But that's the way these things go when you're trying to use a free stash you end up having to buy more yarn because you run out of one colour. So uh, anyway, that's okay. We can live with that. But the colour that I ran out of was the um, the purple silk mohair that I was pairing with the, um, I think it's amethyst. These, so these are Life in the Long Grass mer Merino Singles um, yarns, fingering weight, held double with um, yeah the silk mohair. So the silk mohair that I was using the purple one was from Pearl Soho and I had ordered that, or I had had it in my stash from about three years ago when I uh, was buying other yarn, I think I was buying linen quill uh, from Pearl Soho and I uh, saw they had a sale on for some of their colours in their silk mohair and I ordered one or two of those because they were on sale and I thought to myself, I, I was saying I'm not going to go back to Pearl Soho because it's so expensive really for one ball of yarn just to do a knit from stash project, I thought, no, it's, that's a bit crazy. So I decided not to order from Pearl Soho. And then I was looking all over for something that was similar to this really, really dual toned purple. And I couldn't find anything anywhere. So I thought, oh, let's go and look at the Pearl Soho website. And I did that and I thought to myself, I can't believe I'm doing this. But as it turned out, by luck, um, they, it was out of stock, or not out of stock, I think they might have discontinued that particular colour in this, in the, it's called Tussock. Tussock is the name of the Pearl Soho yarn that, uh, the silk mohair that I had been using. And they didn't have any. And so I thought, oh well, that's great. <laughs> so I actually have to go and find it, or find an alternative much closer to home. So I did, and I ended up the best place in, in Ireland particularly that I found to go to for um, a place where, which dyes up the yarn in the colour that you want. So dyes to order again is Life in the Long Grass and it's appropriate because it's going together with Life in the Long Grass Merino. So this is the colour, excuse the squeaky chair. So this is, these are the colours now, this is the amethyst and this is the, um, the silk mohair that was dyed up for me um, that I ordered a couple of weeks ago that has slowed this project down a bit. And I can't remember the name of this now, the name of this colour. It's it's a really deep purple colour. Now, it came when it came, I thought, oh my goodness, it's quite a sort of a pale coloured purple. It's not as deep as I thought it was going to be. But actually, the, um, the sort of body, the main, the core of the yarn, the, the, the silk, I suppose, in the yarn is really deep purple. So that's all that matters. It's close, you know, it's not exactly the same as the other one was, but it's very close to it. So they're being held double. And of course, I'll show you the other ones then that I'm holding double. So this is the other Pearl Soho uh, tussock. And this one is uh, Life in the Long Grass. I'm trying to remember the colour again. So we had Amethyst, we had Halcyon, and we had Crush is this one. So this is going with the white so they're going together and then we have this absolutely stunning green color um 
Oh, I have the, I actually have the ball band here, which I can check the, the title of it, if I can see it. I've forgotten all these names because I haven't been working on this project for a few weeks. Um, no, it's not on that one. Okay, so it's a beautiful green colour. <laughs> from Pearl so oh yeah so this one isn't just merino this one has linen in it as well so there's a linen uh, linen merino singles and um, this is going together with the Biche Bouche Le Petit Mohair uh, in the medium green I think it's called so they're my colours and I have reached the point where I am just about to split for the sleeves and I, uh, as I said, I had put it on hold because of the lack of the, the, the purple silk mohair. And I am, um, I think, just from reading about this pattern, so I've made a really, the modifications I've made, I suppose, it's not even a modification, but I made the neck the widest I possibly could, because if anybody has made this before, you'll know that the neck in the picture on the uh, pattern itself is not what the neck knits up to be uh, if you follow the pattern. So I wanted a wide neck like the picture and I've done the widest neck possible and I've adapted then by uh, changing the number of times I decrease, reducing the number of times I, sorry, increase, reducing the number of increases because it's already starting at a wide uh, number, of, a large number of stitches. So, um, and also I think people were saying that it, Hello again everybody, um, I had to stop there to um, just change the card in the camera, so cheers here's to uh, the summer's day again. Mm, here's to midsummer. So I realised when I looked back at that last section that I was getting a lot of light in through the window here, a lot of sunlight which was causing problems with the um, with the camera being able to manage that amount of light so uh, apologies for that and um, I'll continue on with the blinds down now so I hope this is an improved version and I thought I'd show you this again the Soldatna crop in a better light so um, so you could see the colours properly so that's my Soldatna and I really can't wait to keep working on this and to finish it and to wear it it's going to be probably too warm for a summer top even though it's a short sleeve top, um, but I will definitely wear it in the autumn, uh, possibly with a nice warm uh, long sleeved garment underneath it. So, um, so excited about this. Oh, and I was saying actually towards the end of that last section, I was saying that I had made adjustments to make the neck wider. So this is the widest neck, the biggest size neck on the pattern. And I changed the number of increases then in the yoke. I reduced them so that I ended up meeting the number of um, stitches that I needed at the um, the place where you split for the sleeves and um, that is appropriate for a size 5 I think I'm doing on this one. So whatever size anyway I decided to do for my um, body size and um, that's what we're doing there. So um, I'm so loving this project and Life in the Long Grass of course features um, in the uh, the main colours of the yarn. So this was the yarn that was given to me kindly by Caroline of Life in the Long Grass earlier on this year and I think colours that she chose to send me represent um, the colours of Heather in the Irish landscape. So um, and that for anybody who hasn't seen this podcast before is the meaning of the word Freach. So Freach knits means Heather. Heather knits. And um, the reason I chose that word is partly because I love the sound of the Irish word for Heather, I love the sound of the word Freach, and also I love the, uh, the fact that I have it outside my door. I live on the side of a mountain, practically, in the west of Ireland, and the Heather is just coming into flower now, actually, so you can see this beautiful bloom of uh, purples and pinks and whites all along the hedgerows, particularly the hedgerows and the little roads around here, uh, around where I live. So that's that project. So um, that's really all of the knitting content in terms of actual active projects or finished projects. But um, because I ordered that extra yarn, so just to show you again without the sun blowing it out, this was the, the yarn that Life in the Long Grass dyed up for me to replace the Pearl Soho uh, 
uh, one that I ran out of and this is the um, amethyst that I'm pairing that with and when I ordered this from, Pro from, uh, sorry, from Life in the Long Grass I decided to buy some yarn with it because um, there's, a, there's a cost involved in shipping even within Ireland and I just thought look I might as well just order a few more um, skeins of yarn while I'm at it even though I'm trying not to spend money on yarn this year at all because I have so much in my stash but I just thought no I deserve some after six months of buying no yarn I deserve to buy some so this is these are the gorgeous gorgeous skeins of yarn that I bought from Life in the Long Grass so these are my acquisitions very proud acquisitions this is the color gorse these are all merino singles um, variegated yarns and these were all available ready to ship so I ordered the silk mohair in the purple colorway I can't remember the actual name but um, I ordered that dyed to order and then these were all available this one was uh, what's this one called gray slake beautiful gray color this one is called um, fire clay set and we move on to these absolutely stunning reds this is terracotta and then we have the final absolutely beautiful one baroque so um, these are the colours that I ordered from Life in the Long Grass when I was getting my replacement yarn for the Soldatna and I have no idea what I'm going to do with these, but I actually just want to sit and look at them because they're so beautiful. So uh, who knows what they'll become, but I'm sure, as you can see, there's a sort of an autumn theme going on here in these colours. And it's autumn is really only around the corner, even though we've only just reached the middle of the summer. Um, but it's only a few months away and I'm sure that I will be using them up. Possibly I could be using them in the uh, Mystery Cal that's organised by Stephen West every year that I loved the excitement and fun of so much last year or possibly not, I might reuse them before then but I thought you might like to see those beautiful colours and um, yeah, I'm really delighted with them so it looks like Godot's coming up to say hello come on Godot are you coming up? good boy there we go so Godot is, uh, is, has come up to say hello and um, we have some sad news about Godot's sister. Well, hopefully not sad news, but at the moment we're missing Tiger Lily, our black cat. She never makes an appearance in these podcasts because uh, she's quite a sort of self-contained female shy cat. And um, But she's been missing for about two and a half weeks now. Um, we think she's done this before though. Um, when she was very little, she disappeared for about three weeks. But she did turn up, she did come back again in one piece and I think she's just so well adapted to minding herself, to looking after herself that she could easily be off at some other house nearby feeding and getting fed and looked after by somebody else. So we're hoping that that's the case. And we put out an ad on Facebook to, to say to people, to ask people to tell us if they saw her around here. So, uh, so people are looking out for her. So in the meantime, Godo is on his own and he's with us and he has become a little more needy since she's gone because they were great pals and uh, even though they fought a lot as well, which is typical sibling rivalry, I suppose. But anyhow, that's where we're at at the moment, down to, to one of our beautiful cats. I'm so thrilled to still have Godo with us and still have him keeping us company here. He's a great cat. So yeah, so I was going to talk to you a little bit about um, Midsummer and the uh, the plant I was going to talk to you about this week is the fern. And uh, so, but before we get on to that, I think I was going to talk to you a little bit about some of the things that I have been doing in the last while um, uh, that are related actually it all ties together. So I'm just going to look at my notes here and see where I was going to go with that. Um, I know that a lot of you who watch this podcast really enjoy the knitting, but you also enjoy this piece on Irish culture and um, the place of our uh, major festivals of the year uh, in, in Irish myth and legend. Um, so if you are just here for the knitting, that's absolutely fine. Um, 
I that I have stopped talking about knitting now pretty much and um, we'll be moving into this other section. So you're very welcome to stay if this is your first time watching the podcast, you're really welcome to join us and to just uh, hear a little bit about Irish culture um, and the myths and legends associated this time with Midsummer. Um, and with this time, with the the fern, which is also associated with this time of the year. Um, oh yeah, I know what I was going to tell you actually. Um, I was um, I've been getting uh, just wanted to sh talk to you about an interesting read that I came across recently. So this is a new book that I bought uh, on rewilding. So rewilding is a topic that I have just become interested in from. Um, just really an interest in trying to do something about uh, the way the planet is going in terms of uh, climate change and we can really notice it in Ireland this summer everything is it's uh, the temperatures are just much higher than they would normally be which is really nice but at the same time at the back of your mind you're thinking it's probably not it's fun it's not a good sign in terms of the health of the environment and the uh, strength of biodiversity but I've been allowing my, as you saw in my last podcast, I've been allowing my garden to grow pretty much wild and I've seen a huge increase in wildflowers and with that a huge increase in insects and with that more wild birds than I think we've ever had around here um, since we've moved in here anyway only three years ago. So uh, and before when I moved in the, the lawn was cut, everything was really neat, the lawn was cut really really short and the um, there was a uh, half of my property was being grazed by sheep so uh, my local farmer was renting land and grazing the sheep and so everything was really really uh, neat and since then I've just completely pretty much let everything grow uh, the, the sheep are no longer on the part of the land where they were and my garden has grown really really wild so uh, I since I've been looking a little bit about on the internet about what's available to read and this book is called Wilding and it's by Isabella Tree. And Isabella Tree is the wife of uh, Richard Burrell, I think his name is, and they own the Nepp estate in Sussex in England. So it's K-N-E-P-P. -P. And this is the story of the rewilding journey that they've been on since about 2001. So I still haven't read it, but I've seen a lot of videos about the story of Nepp and it's so encouraging. It's in a, in a world where I think sometimes we get bogged down in the negative. This is such an encouraging story and it shows that things can happen really quickly in terms of the, the Earth, Mother Earth coming back to herself. It took 20 years at NEP to reach a stage where they, they're really blown away by the, particularly the insect population has just rocketed, skyrocketed and, uh, and because I was interested in, in NEP then of course on my uh, feed both Instagram and on YouTube, um, I'm getting loads of information now about Irish Irish rewilding projects and one of those that I wanted to tell you about and I haven't bought his book yet but is Owen Dal Dalton, I was calling him Dalton, his name is Dalton, D-A-L-T-U-N, Owen and he owns a farm down in West Cork in the Bear Peninsula in Iris and he um, so it's a really really stunning part of Ireland and I've done loads of walks down there and really really love the place but he's rewilding about 33 acres and he also shares in 40 acres in commonage and his book is called An Atlantic Rainforest A Personal Journey into the Magic of Rewilding and this is all uh, by way of coming around to talking to you about the fern so the fern is the um, is the plant that I want to discuss with you today and uh, talk about its its connection with Irish myths and Irish legend and um, but for the fern anyhow is connected to Owen's um, Owen Dalton's story of West Cork and his rewilding project down there and um, so basically he discovered a wide range of uh, native trees and he facilitated their growth uh, not least with fencing off areas to protect the farm from uh, tree, tree damaging animals like goats and sika deer. So he fenced off areas to allow these to grow and the fern is something that he featured recently on his um, on his Instagram page which is at Irish Rainforest. I think it's Irish Rainforest is what it's called. So basically he's created a temperate Irish 
our temperate rainforest. Um, and amazingly, he also featured a place really close to us here called Old Head Woods. Uh, we live about five kilometres away from it, and it is a, the last remnants of an ancient Irish rainforest. And I knew it was an old, old forest, but I didn't realise it was could be called a, a rainforest. And I um, am part of, I'm a leader with a group, a local group of scouts, and I had found a walk up on top of Old Head Hill that came back around by the rainforest. And on the 1st of May, I did a, um, I did a sort of a recce of this walk with my sister and it was really easy to walk and then on the about two weeks ago or maybe not even two weeks ago last week we were bringing the scouts out i was the one who was leading and all of a sudden the, the, the walk that i had brought um, my sister on at the beginning of may had been completely transformed by ferns so this is why i wanted to talk to you about them today because um, they're just absolutely fascinating. They're such a mysterious plant, they just came out of absolutely nowhere to cover the whole of the hillside and they made our walk a little bit tricky, but we managed it in the end. Um, anyway, um, yeah, so these magical plants had completely transformed the hillside and I will sh put up photographs showing you our walk and showing you the scouts walking through what had essentially become a jungle um, in, a, in a month, in a whole, in the space, a very short space of time, in a month's time. So that's what inspired me to talk about ferns today. And as I was reading about ferns, I realised they're actually connected in a big way with Midsummer. So Midsummer was on the summer solstice, was the 21st of June, which was last week. And then in Ireland, we celebrate, uh, or last not, I was going to say in Ireland, actually, in the west of Ireland, we have um, the, the ancient tradition of lighting bonfires on the 23rd of June, which is the eve of St. John, St. John the Baptist. So St. John's Eve, 23rd of June, in Mayo particularly, and in other parts of the west of Ireland, you have this tradition surviving of uh, lighting a bonfire. And it's not something I grew up with. I grew up in the middle of the country, uh, near Athlone, and the only time we had bonfires there was at Halloween. So for Samhain we had we had bonfires, but not for St. John's Eve. And it's the opposite way here. The bonfires are more prevalent at St. John's Eve and not so much at all. The Irish fern, or the Irish word for fern is Ratnach Moor, and um, it's also known as Bracken. Um, and as I was saying to you, it just springs up almost uh, mysteriously overnight, over, over a couple of weeks from the beginning of May to the beginning of June. And then it grows really, really tall and green uh, on the hillsides and on the roadsides. This is actually from the hedgerow in my front garden. Um, so it's very much part of this whole uh, Atlantic rainforest system that I was talking to you about that Owen Dalton has been um, featuring in his uh, podcast, or his, not his podcast, his um, Instagram page on rewilding. And um, I had never really thought terribly much about ferns before. They're so everywhere, they're ubiquitous, you just see them around and that you take them for granted. Um, but they're such an interesting plant. And um, they were seen in Irish myth and legend and folklore. They were seen as strange and magical plants because they bore neither flowers nor fruit. Um, and they produce mysterious, almost invisible seeds which are technically spores, um, apparently, and um, it was valued as um, providing fertile ash after burning it and as bedding in the autumn when the dry, uh, the dry leaves of the dry branches um, turn red and brown. So it was, it was a bedding material and way back into as far as Viking Ireland, the excavations in Dublin at Wood Quay have uh, shown evidence of the use of ferns for bedding for both people and animals. Um, so a widespread, in terms of the, the seeds then, the seeds, I don't know if you can see them here, um, and this is something I've only begun to realize after cutting uh, a few branches of the ferns, is that the seeds are tucked away on the backs of the leaves here. So apparently they're technically spores, but they do look like these little discs on the backs of the leaves. So that's where the seeds are. And, um, Apparently, there was a widespread belief in Britain and Ireland that um, 
the fern seed if it was gathered on St. John's Eve. So the, the traditional Irish uh, celebration of Midsummer, St. John's Eve. If you gathered the fern seed on that date, um, it would make the bearer invisible. How incredible is that? So uh, they're considered to be magical, magical plants. Um, and the reason behind this is thought that to be because the fern seed itself is practically invisible because it's hidden at the backs of the of the leaves. Um, and so because of that, because the seeds were invisible, it could bestow the same property on the bearer of the seed. So the seed had to be carefully collected on white paper at midnight and the paper then folded up and carried in the pocket. Uh, and the carrier could then enter homes and buildings and plunder money and treasures without being discovered. So really imaginative um, notion there of the, the use of fern seeds and, and their magical qualities uh, in the story, ancient stories of, of this part of the world. But there was a difficulty in collecting the seed because all the powers of evil and darkness would do their best to frighten off the collector. Although they could not touch him, unearthly yells, screams and whir whirlwinds or fiendish apparitions were employed to make the person lose their, their nerve in collecting them apparently. Gosh, it sounds quite, uh, quite serious. Um, indeed, stories relate how those who successfully collected the seed often lost their wits in the process. So this is, um, I think, this idea of losing your mind um, over the fern seeds is, uh, it turns up again in, in other stories later on in, uh, in this book that I use every time. Um, I'll just show it to you again in case it's your first time watching this podcast. It's Neil McCutcher and it's Ireland's Wild Plants. So there's a whole chapter on ferns. Ferns are considered in the Brehon Laws to be one of the noble um, the noble bushes of the wood, I think, they're, they're considered. So the, word, the old ancient Irish laws um, held plants and trees sacred. And uh, so if you were to destroy or, or to, you had to destroy a whole field of bracken, you would have been uh, fined one year old heifer. So they took, they took plants and trees seriously uh, and they, were, they had all sorts of um, myths and, and stories connected with them. So in Ireland it was believed that carrying fern seed about in your pocket would bring good luck, good luck at cards particularly, um, and the tiny rows of golden seeds of fern linked it in folklore to gold and treasure. Uh, in Bohemia then it was believed that fern seed bloomed like gold and that whoever collected it and ascended a mountain with it on Midsummer's Eve again um, would discover a vein of gold. So I, I presume all of this connection with Midsummer is that the uh, the ferns have literally just sprung up out of the ground, and they now and they've produced all of these seeds. So midsummer is the perfect time for collecting, um, collecting the seeds, um, because the ferns are, are in such abundance. So if you climb to the top of a mountain on midsummer's eve with your with your fern seeds, and um, you discover a vein of gold. Um, in Switzerland, then it was believed that if a person waited by a fern on Saint John's night, the devil would appear and present, uh, present him with treasure, so and again associated with treasure and gold. Fern or bracken is noted for its ability to spread, and so in Ireland it became known as a sign of uh, being prolific. And there's a shanuckle, um, or an old Irish saying, which describes something abundant as corahwyr le lesh an rachnig, which means as prolific as the fern, corahwyr lesh an rachnig. Um, and a saying from the north of England then um, goes like this, it says, says where there's bracken there's gold, where there's gorse there's silver and where there's heather there's poverty. So I did uh, tell you about a similar Irish saying when I was talking to you about heather in one of my earlier podcasts and I looked back over that and it was the same from County Kerry which is very similar to this except that it says um, that instead of Bracken, where there's gorse, there's gold, where there are rushes, there's silver, and where there's heather, there's poverty. So the Irish goes on Tor Fuinachin, on Tarragat Fuin Lucher, and on Gartha Fuin Vreach. So there's um, very sim strong similarities between those two, except that gorse was the gold in the Irish version, in the Kerry version, and fern was the gold in the North of England version. So interesting to see that there's a really similar versions of the same poem 
or the same sayings existed in England and Ireland, um, you know, back in, I don't know how long ago these things date back to, but certainly a long time, um, part of the folklore of both countries. So Bracken was widely valued in folklore for its benevolent powers as well. In Ireland it was called Mary's Fern because it was believed St. Joseph used it as bedding for the Virgin Mary um, and the Christ Child. In Wales, um, wagoners would put a bunch of fern over the horse's ears or on their collar to keep the devil away and to baffle witches. So a very benevolent, uh, benign um, use or, or association there. Um, in Scotland, fern was believed to be one of those plants avoided by witches. Um, and it was also used in love charms. The roof, of, or sorry, the root of bracken. Bracken root is believed to be a valuable ingredient in love potions. And an old Gaelic saying goes, "'Twas not the maiden's matchless beauty that drew my heart and eye, not the fern root potion, but the glance of her eye." So really beautiful, uh, and a mention of fern root potion there. In England, an old belief was that if a woman put a leaf of bracken that she had gathered on St. John's Eve at midsummer in a man's left shoe, she would make him, him love her. So again, the love connection and the Midsummer's Eve. And um, yeah, so it's just all connected there. But sometimes as well, apparently there were negative beliefs um, associated with the fern. Um, some believed that for a traveler to step on a fern, it would cause him to lose his way. Um, then in terms of myths and legends, the use of the fern for making fires appears several times in Irish myth. So a story from the life of St. Patrick tells how he was given a site for a church on the west side of the River Ban. This is in Northern Ireland, in present day Northern Ireland, at a place where, and this is where the children are burning the fern. So this was the, the, how he named the place, the place where the children are burning the fern which um, in Irish is Cool Rahan um, and now known as Coleraine today. So there you go. Um, it was that place was known as Coleraine from the time of St. Patrick onwards, or Cool Rahan. So Coleraine is in, in the north, the north of Ireland. I think not far actually from where um, Woolly Mammoth Fibres is based. Um, she's somewhere near there in, in north. Um, so Fern appears in Irish myth as a fairy or magical plant. In the tale of Anton Bo Cúlne, or the cattle raid of Cooley, the warrior Nera enters a fairy mound at Samhain, and it, it is summer in fairyland, so he returns from the mound carrying flowers that, that actually proves that it was summertime where he had gone. Um, and uh, the flowers that he brings out are golden fern, wild garlic and primrose, so it's, uh, it's a sign of summertime. Basically, the fern is a sign of the summer. I actually have never really associated the fern with summer because I think that for me it's a beautiful gold and red colours that it turns is more, um, I suppose they're more visible in the autumn when you see them dying and turning red and brown and gold. But certainly they, they just uh, spring out of nowhere in the summertime. Another legend tells how Nechton, thus the King of Munster, successfully deceived Bruce, the King of Ireland, who had levied a tax on the milk of every hornless dun cow in Ireland. Now, dun cow, I'm interpreting here as being a sort of a light brown colour. Nechton avoided the tax by singeing all of the cows of Ireland over a fire of fern and then smearing, um, smearing them with ashes of flaxseed to make them look dark brown instead of dun. So, uh, yeah, the ashes of ferns. Were, um, were definitely featured in, in lots of myth and story. They were also included, as I've already said, in the Irish Brehan laws and were considered one of the noble bushes of the woods and um, unlawful clearing of fields of bracken um, led to a fine of a year old heifer. Um, and it is represents the ohm letter, this is the ancient Irish alphabet, fern represents the ohm letter GW. Um, in the Book of Invasions then, the Laura Gawala, the first brew, brewer, brewer as in beer brewer of Ireland, was named as Malaliach, uh, and he made Lind Raha or Fern Ale. So they made beer out of ferns as well. 
And this is something as well that happens apparently or used to be uh, carried out in Norway. The fronds of both male fer fern and bracken were used to make beer. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a widespread, it was a widespread thing that, that ferns were used for beer making. Um, so other uses would be um, burning it to make ash to use either to bleach linen apparently or to make a soil fertilizer. Um, the ash from fern was also mixed with lard to make a soap and in traditional herbal medicine a decoction of the root of bracken was mixed with honey and recommended as a dewormer for those troubles with worms. Um, and however it does contain, it contains a poison apparently it's poisonous. Uh, to consume it, it's, it's got uh, contained cyanide, um, so quite a, a mysterious plant uh, altogether. Definitely not for eating or for making tea. It's not this one. So um, that's really that's really all there is to say about fern. And um, I just wanted to I suppose um, tell you a little bit about uh, midsummer. So the summer solstice. Um, in the solstice, the word for solstice in Irish is greenstad, which literally means when the sun stops, green is sun, stop is stop. So it's the stopping of the sun. Um, so it was considered a really potent time of the year and hence the practice of uh, uh, having a bonfire and uh, celebrating the light, celebrating the turn of the year, um, celebrating the highest point of the sun and its decline. Uh, back down and the oncoming harvest, um, a time of, of great growth of, of uh, crops. So definitely associated, it, it, it's definitely a thing from rural Ireland, the, the, the bonfire and, and therefore the, the midsummer bonfire is a rural Irish thing and apparently they used to have the fires on uh, hilltops so it was a really spectacular sight. You do see a lot of them around here in people's gardens mainly um, at, at this time of the year and um, but it was it's associated with agriculture so it was less an urban an urban thing and very associated with the the turning of the year um, moving on towards the harvest towards autumn so uh, it's um, yeah at this in where we live here on the west coast of Ireland so I had a bonfire on Friday night, which was St. John's Eve to celebrate. I had some friends over and it was just a magical evening because the the sky just stays, there was a really beautiful pink sunset, which was probably at about, I don't know, 11 or half 11 at this time of the year. The sun only, it sets really late. And right up until about one o'clock in the morning, we had, you could see brightness in the Western sky. I mean, it was, it was getting darker obviously, but I think it took until about one o'clock for it to get dark. And then it starts getting bright again at about three or four o'clock in the morning. So we're not quite in the same region or realm of uh, the land of the midnight sun, but we're not far away from that. And um, uh, yeah, so it's just a beautiful time of the year. And uh, Great to celebrate around a fire. There's something really magical about having an, uh, a fire that people are gathered around and everybody's just uh, chatting and watching the flames and uh, really happy to be able to be sit to be able to sit outside because the, the weather here normally you would be you know wrapped up at that, that time of the evening you'd have your your jumpers and your your rain gear on it had been lashing rain actually up until about seven o'clock on Friday evening and I was people were asking me was I going to call it off and I said no no we'll we'll just you know we'll hold we'll hold out we'll see see does it uh, does it stop and it did it stopped at about I'd say eight o'clock the rain stopped and it was a really war really muggy warm day and uh, so we were able to sit out just in our normal clothes you know no big we didn't have to wrap up in big uh, rain gear or, or jumpers or anything so yeah that's uh that's midsummer i can't believe that we're we're at that time of the year already and um it's just a wonderful time of the year everything is just in full bloom and uh the growth is, is phenomenal it's absolutely tremendous so um that's really all there is for me to tell you about today i'm so glad that i've been able to to get around to making this podcast and um, and that it's coinciding with Midsummer. And as I said to you, the next podcast that I will make will be, the next video that I make will be on um, my podiversary, which is the beginning of July, sometime around the beginning of July. So I can't believe that I've actually been making these videos for a year, 
they're so much fun to make and um, I really enjoy the impetus it gives me as well to both to get some knitting done to show you and also to read about these absolutely fabulous myths and traditions associated with the different times of the year and with all of the plants that are just literally growing around me and around us um, you know once you once you allow once you allow the uh, the soil to the seed bank that's in the soil to uh, push up whatever is there um, it's your it's just amazing what comes up and I've really benefited from that um, from allowing my my feet in my garden and the fields down below to to be rewilded a little bit and I hope you enjoy those books that I that I recommended the wilding by Isabella tree and an Irish rainforest by Owen Dalton and um, and also of course the Irish the islands Ireland's wild plants I'm getting tongue tied uh, by Neil McCutcher and uh, yeah that's pretty much it for now I'm going to leave you I don't have footage this week but I'm going to leave you with some photographs of the uh, our trip through the ferns at Old Head Woods a couple of weeks ago uh, I'll leave you oh there was one story I knew there was something else I wanted to tell you and that is the uh, the day that I brought the scouts out on Old Head and we were walking through the ferns uh, we had a part of the trip on the way back down was through part of that old rainforest and so we were ducking and diving under branches and uh, of trees to to continue to follow the path and my mobile phone was in an outside pocket of my backpack so it wasn't actually um, properly um, put away and I got down to the bottom and I realised oh my god my phone is gone so I real I remembered when I had last had it, which was probably about maybe 15 minutes of a walk uh, through all of the, these ferns up to the top of the hill. And I thought uh, I had to bring the scouts back to their parents first and then go and find a friend to help me to, um, to look for the phone. So my great knitting friend Barbara um, helped me and uh, I was just cut off there when I was telling you that's the story of the finding of my mobile phone. So I'm just going to finish up really quickly. Um, the phone was found with Barbara's help. She kept ringing it and we walked all the way up to the top of the hill. We didn't find it and on the way down I thought oh that's it I'll have to get a new phone. Um, but that's fine. I had sort of resigned myself to the fact that it was gone. So anyway um, it was getting dark at this stage. It was probably after 11 o'clock I'd say. Um, and after 40 minutes of looking and carefully walking through this pathway of, of really overgrown ferns um, it was getting dark and the phone, I was right, the sound had been switched off, there was no sound on, um, there was, a, it was I think set to vibrate but we weren't going to hear that in the, in the soft undergrowth and eventually I saw this glow of light coming from the undergrowth uh, at a certain point and uh, it was the phone. So a complete miracle really to actually to find it in that, it was like a needle in a haystack but we found it and uh, so I was absolutely thrilled with myself and Barbara was brilliant. We, we actually put the, uh, she took some photographs of us, uh, me waving the phone around, <laughs> really happy to have found it. Um, so yeah, it was amazing, no sound, just the, the glow of the light and there had been 52 calls from Barbara ringing it to help us try and find it and there was 8% battery left. So if I hadn't looked for it that night, I would never have found it. And um, So anyway, it's a lesson to always put your mobile phone into a zipped pocket when you're going hiking or walking out in the woods or the wilds. Um, but yeah. That's it, got the phone back. So I have photographs of that day and I have photographs of uh, um, us finding the phone, Barbara myself finding the phone and beautiful photographs of the of Clue Bay on that evening with the sun going down and just a sea of ferns and trees around us. So a uh, really stunning part of the country and so lucky to have so close to it. So that's the end of that amazing story and uh, my inspiration for looking at ferns and looking at midsummer, uh, this podcast. I hope you've enjoyed it all. I hope you enjoyed the stories. And if you have, if you liked the podcast, please um, consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell because I know that helps people to find, uh, to see when my podcast comes up again because I'm a bit erratic at the moment 
with the number of weeks between podcasts because everything is so busy. I think I had become regular uh, every three weeks I was I was issuing, uh, posting a video, but now it was five weeks the last time and it's four weeks this time, so I think um, it's, it's a bit all over the place. So just so that people can find it and spread the news, uh, so like the video, uh, subscribe to it if you haven't already, and leave a comment if you feel so inclined, and I'd love to hear about your knitting, um, any thoughts you have on what I've knit and uh, any of the yarns that I've been using and anybody who lives near a rainforest somewhere, any thoughts on ferns or, or associations, um, your stories associated with Midsummer, I'd love to hear them. So thank you all so much for watching. It's been such a pleasure to, to do this podcast. Great to be back with you again and looking forward to the next one, which will be one year anniversary of me doing this uh, podcasting thing and I'm so delighted that I've kept kept going because at times it's been a little bit hard to, to keep it up. Um, the enthusiasm starts to wane after a while because it becomes a, bit, a little bit like a little bit like work um, but in a good way though I mean once I do a podcast I feel great and uh, you know there's always loads to talk about. Um, I, you know sometimes I think I don't have enough material and then all of a sudden nearly an hour has gone by and I've been yabbering away and chatting. Uh, so it's been a great chat this time and once again um, here's to midsummer and I hope you all have enjoyed it and uh, you are looking forward to the rest of the summer and enjoying whatever you get up to in whatever part of the world or if you're in the winter, if you're in the southern hemisphere, I hope you're enjoying the winter down there. Um, so yeah, Thank you so much for listening and I uh, hope to see you next time. Take care wherever you are, look after yourselves and we'll chat soon again. Okay, bye for now. Bye bye. Don't be a stranger a chance for some romance don't copy your eyes we'll love trees know you better than anyone else it's time you let your guard down for someone like me I'd say I'm settled I don't storm in the storm If not me, then someone like me That knows what to do and how to take care of you But most of all, that deserves you You stand beside me in every dream Angel goddess, you cover them all Say, what can I do to get you to fall? For someone like me Deserves you. Go with someone like me.